Hello and welcome to Durlam's Dirty Dugout Sports Blog, the first video feature of the new blog that I've just started on June 1st. And this video feature is going to be on the two articles on The Ohio State University's current football scandal about players receiving improper benefits, cash, among other things, Jim Tressel resigning, selling of memorabilia, possibly for uh, marijuana, also cars, uh, changing hands, a lot of cars being looked into right now. So I'm just going to go through the first couple of parts of the article. It's a five-part series. Right now there's two parts below listed for June 1st and June 2nd. And we're just going to go over the details right now, some of the car scandals that have come out, the comments Ray Small made about the program and how it is a systemic problem, unlike what Athletic Director Gene Smith had said at an earlier press conference when the original five players were suspended for tattoos. We'll get into the tattoo gate and the tattooed five players and what impact the new allegations by Sports Illustrated could have on them. We're going to get into that tomorrow, uh, but for now we're just going to stick to the tattooed five and along those other topics. Just basically what could happen at the next uh, few months for Ohio State and what this process has looked like so far. So to start things off, we'll just go from the beginning of this thing, how it all started. And it started on December 23rd, 2010, about a week before the Sugar Bowl, Ohio State Athletic Director Gene Smith announced that Terrell Pryor, Devere Posey, Dan Boomheron, Mike Adams, Solomon Thomas were all suspended for five games for selling memorabilia and receiving discounted services at Fine Line Inc., which is a local tattoo parlor in Columbus. These players were all suspended for five games, as I just mentioned. They made an apology on April 28th as part of their suspension, and the players were ordered to pay back all of the money that they got from selling their memorabilia. Pryor was ordered to repay $2,500 for selling his 2008 Big Ten Championship ring, Fiesta Bowl Sportsmanship Award, and his 2008 Golden Pants, which all the Buckeyes receive if they defeat Michigan in the football game within the calendar year. Mike Adams must repay $1,000 for selling his 2008 Big Ten Championship ring. Dan Heron must repay $1,000 for selling his jersey, pants, and cleats for $1,000. And he also received $150 in discounted tattoo services, which he must pay back. Devere Posey sold his 2008 Big Ten Championship ring for $1,200, and he also received some discounted tattoo work. And the other two players, Solomon Thomas, uh, and there was a, another player, a lineman, excuse me, a linebacker, who was suspended for just a game, Solomon Thomas. The brunt of his uh, alleged crime, NCAA violations were mainly tattoo services, so he was suspended for five games as well for the 2011 season, but these players were not suspended for the Sugar Bowl, which was an extremely controversial decision. The NCAA letting the players play in the postseason bowl game due to a clause that they'd put in not too long ago, separating the regular season and postseason and saying that if things are found out near the end of the year, they should not be, the, the reward at the end of the year for the postseason play should not be taken away from the players. Kind of controversial that they're going to say, hey, you know, you broke all these rules, but we're going to let you play in the big money game for your team, and you're going to have to miss Akron, Toledo, Miami of Florida, Colorado, and Michigan State next year. Five games that really shouldn't pose a threat to Ohio State's schedule, even with the five players missing. So there could be a lot of could have been a lot of alternative motives behind that, but we're not going to go too deep into that because that could take a while, and that's a completely separate issue. But along the same day that the players apologized, Athletic Director Gene Smith said, "Quote: There are no other NCAA violations around this case. We are very fortunate that we do not have a systemic problem in our program." This is isolated to these young men and isolated to this particular instance. And this appeared to be the case until about March. Everything had died down until mid-March when OSU began conduct conducting their internal investigation on this matter. And they began preparing an appeal for the NCAA when they came across emails from Chris Cicero to head coach Jim Tressel about the five suspended Buckeye players. Now, if you haven't heard about who Chris Cicero is, he's a Columbus lawyer who played football as a walk-on at Ohio State in the mid-1980s. 
And he sent these emails to Jim Trussell in April 2010, alerting him that these five players that ended up getting suspended for the tattoos and trading in memorabilia, he had alerted them that they were doing these things at Fine Line Inc. and advised Trussell to take some sort of action. So Trussell replied, I will get on it ASAP, but never forward to them to his athletic director, Gene Smith, University President Gordon Gee, or the Ohio State Compliance Office, which was in direct violation of his contract, which means the Buckeyes at that moment could have terminated him without pay, which they ended up doing when he resigned, but we'll get to that in a moment. However, Trussell did find the time to send these emails to Terrell, Pressel, to Terrell Pryor's mentor in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, to try and take care of the issue. So, basically, Trestle got these emails, covered it up because he was worried his players on the number two team in the country in the preseason poll weren't going to be able to play, weren't going to be able to chase a national title. And that was really, I think, in my mind, the only reason that he let those players play. I know that he came out and said, oh, I'm looking out for the interest and confidentiality of the players. No, that's not how it happened. He knew if he cut those five guys out, they were not going to win a national title and maybe not even contend for a Big Ten title without those five players. So he knowingly played them when he knew they would be ineligible because he needed to win at all costs. Maybe, uh, you know, it's nothing. It's just, it's the way it is. It's not a reflection of Jim Trestle as a man outside of coaching, but in that instance of coaching, he was looking to win any way that he could win, and that's the problem. And that's why he has ended up resigning, but once again, we'll get to that in a moment. So on March 30th, Trestle admitted and apologized for his cover-up on March 30th and was suspended by Ohio State for just two games for the 2011 season and fined $250,000, which is just an absolute joke that Ohio State, they've handled this thing the wrong way from the beginning. Suspending Trestle for just two games when he has had a history of NCAA troubles put Youngstown State in a big hole just before he left. Maurice Claret came forward with some things back in 2003. So this isn't the first time the NCAA has been sniffing around Jim Trestle. And yet, amidst all of this controversy, the fact that Jim Trestle violated the NCAA bylaw when it comes to reporting this type of information three times, they still only suspended him for just two games. And even after knowingly he signed a document in September saying he knew nothing about the violations within the program, even though he knowingly played ineligible players, as we just talked about, didn't tell anything to his superiors in December when these players were suspended either. And that's just ridiculous that he did not, you know, he let all the player, the five players take the heat for what's going on, saying he knew nothing about it, and then decides that, you know, once they find these emails, now Trestle's going to come out, take the heat, and then he ended up deciding to take a five-game suspension with his players, which, you know, the only reason he did it was because he was backed into a corner with the media, and I personally just feel that way that the only time Ohio State has acted in this instance is when their backs were against the wall. Trestle, his back was entirely against the wall, taking all kinds of heat in the media for only being suspended two games, so he decided to lengthen his pl the suspension to match that of his players. But still, that's just an absolute slap on the wrist. The guy was going to be able to coach Monday through Friday and just not be able to make the game calls on Saturday. But mainly, the stuff that goes on, the importance to a football team, goes on Monday through Friday, and you really just need a manager in there on game day because... I mean, let's be honest, if you haven't prepared enough to that point in time on Saturday, you're not going to win the football game. That's the big issue that was at hand there. But, you know, Ohio State, they won't have to deal with that now with Trestle resigning. Once again, we'll get to that. Um, 